unfortunately, due to the COVID rules, we're not allowed to, to sing. So it'll just be me. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Steve. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everybody here. It's great to be back face to face again, isn't it? Yes. I'm actually allowed to take this off now so you can hear me without all the muffle. I am delighted to be here back in the church. It's very difficult when we're separated by distance and uh, the only connection we have is on the computer and some of us don't actually even use computers. So it's like a real separation that happens. So getting back together into fellowship just really encourages my heart. How about you guys? It's good, isn't it? I'd like to thank you for being faithful and being here this morning. I really appreciate it. It's encouraging. Well, you guys, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Mike. You've all done a great job. What, what's the matter, Eric? Mike. Oh, my mic. Thank you. Yeah, so happy Father's Day, everybody. Um, it's a wonderful thing. I have to be careful because before I had um, some single moms. And so I wish them happy Father's Day, too. They're doing both jobs. Why not? Right? It's a hard job. It's a hard go of it. I was a single dad for a little while. And I'll tell you, it was uh, a difficult time in my life. And I'm so thankful for my wife. I think that's a wonderful blessing and gift from God. I'd like to thank everybody who's with us live this morning on uh, Ray of Hope. Uh, thank you for being faithful. Thank you for coming. We're going to do a Father's Day sermon today. And um, I just hope that, uh, that you're touched out there on uh, Facebook and that you're touched here in, in the kingdom, in our church. Uh, a couple of quick things before we get going. Please make sure you're inviting your friends. We need to rebuild the church. We need to get the people back into fellowship. We need to have the, help the church to survive and to keep going. So please continue to do that. It is an important aspect of what we do. Um, not only just bringing our brothers and sisters back into fellowship, but invite some new people too. Let's make disciples in accordance with the Great Commission. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being here with us this morning. Lord, you say, never leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you, God, because you are such an amazing God. I just pray right now, Jesus, that you'll just be with us in this service, that you are lifted up and that you are edified, and that your message is spread to your people. God, I pray that what you would have heard is heard today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you have your uh, Bibles with you this morning, we're going to turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Colossians 3, 21. In the King James Version, this scripture says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Okay, dads, who's ticked off their kids? I know some of you have never done that. You've never done that. No. Oh. The Amplified Version makes it even clearer. Good morning. Bless you. Fathers, do not provoke or irritate or exasperate your children with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by favoritism or indifference. Treat them tenderly with loving kindness so they will not lose heart and become discouraged or unmotivated with their spirits broken. I love the Amplified Bible. They do a lot of research into what's actually being said in context. Their exegesis is really excellent. And so we are called to be an encouragement to our families. Right, guys? Now, most sermons are kind of negative when it comes to Father's Day. It's more like an exhortation or an admonishment. You know, do the best you can, uh, be good, you know, be solid, be strong. But I'd like to just take today, just, just for a moment, and just say, you know what, guys? It is a hard role. Well done. Mm. Right? Every Mother's Day, we thank the mothers. So it's okay, guys. I know we don't want to be a few, yeah, yeah, it's all right, it's all good. But you know what? 
I don't know about you, but I like it when I'm appreciated. How many of you guys like it when you're appreciated? Sure. Yeah. I do. So, we have some context now. Let's look at the King James Version more closely. When I read this scripture, I see three parts. Three parts. We'll go over it again. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Okay? First, there's the context regarding whom it is addressing. In this case, fathers. Right? Second, all fathers are given a command. Do not provoke your children. And third, we're told why we as fathers receive this command. Lest they become discouraged. Now, I don't think there's a father in this place that's ever wanted to see their kids discouraged. I don't think there's many fathers that are like that. If you've experienced a father that's like that, I pray that the Lord heal your heart. We have a tremendous father, amen? God the Father. He's called the Father because he loves us like a father. Do we as fathers have an example to follow? Yes, we really do. Consider the Lord's Prayer in which Jesus taught that we should call upon God the Father. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God himself is the great Father. Now this is going to be extremely unpopular to say, I'm known for that, but although God is God, and he has given us a choice to serve him or not, he is not everyone's father. Ooh. He's not everyone's father. He could be, but he doesn't interfere with the free will of men. I ask you to consider two scriptures this morning. John 8, 42 to 44. That's John 8, 42 to 44. It says this, Jesus told them, if God were your father, notice what he says there, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me, for you are children of your father, the devil. Ouch. And you love to do the things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he has always hated the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, when a person is out there and the God that they are serving is mammon, money, okay? How many of you have seen stories on the television or heard examples or maybe even have friends where they've been in school, they've had a concert, or they play on sports and they have a game? and their father never shows up. Now I'm not talking, sometimes you can't do that. You gotta make hay when the sun shines. Sometimes you can't be there. But never comes. How many have had uh, examples or seen examples where a father has uh, set up a camping trip or something like that and then he's always down at the bottom of the hill on the phone with his company instead of actually being with his family? Anybody else ever heard of those things? Those things are damaging. What message do you think that's giving to the children? Even to the young adults? That my business, what I'm doing, my making of money is more important than spending time with you. Now please understand, I get it. Sometimes we gotta pay the bills. Sometimes we gotta make hay when sun shines. But there's an attitude when a father wants to be with their children 
and when they eschew their family. Who knows what I'm talking about? Sometimes marriages wind up in divorce because sometimes it's not just the children, it's the wives that are not taken care of. Who thinks that's the example of a good father? That's what I thought. Neither do I. How about when a dad says, oh yeah, I'll be there for your game. I'll be there. And then they never show up. Or I'll be there for your birthday. And they don't come. These men are not following the example of God the Father. God the Father says he will never leave us or forsake us. He is always with us. He is comforting. He is guiding. He is leading us each and every day. I thank the Lord that he's given us the example of how to be a good father. So in that scripture in John 8, 42 to 44, we saw Jesus say that God the Father is not the father of those who do not love him. That's kind of radical, isn't it? Because a lot of places teach that God is the father of all. And in a sense, that's true. It's true for those who accept him. It's true for those who recognize him as their father. But the truth is, is that there are those people out there whose father is not God the Father, but rather the father of lies. I want to look at the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 9 to 15 this morning. Romans 8, 9 to 15. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. Wow. See, there's a truth that people don't like to hear. And that truth is that every person that you know is going to live forever. Where are they going to spend that eternity? I'm one of the old school preachers that believes in preaching that hell is still hot. Hell is real and God is on the throne. And we need to serve God. Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That's not a bit Gnostic. I didn't mean it that way. But. but the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Who's thankful for that this morning? Me too. Praise God. That's awesome. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do, for if you live by its dictates, you will die. Wages of sin, right? But if through the power of the Spirit you put death to the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. I had one person say to me, well, Pastor Ray, isn't that kind of exclusionary? I mean, in our culture today, we accept everybody and we accept all these people and whatnot. How can you exclude people from this membership in the kingdom? And the answer I have for them is very simple. I am not excluding you at all. You are choosing not to be a part of the kingdom. So you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. I think that's so cool. Abba, Father. It's so cool, I'll say it backwards. Abba. Abba. Abba means father. Did you know that? Not to be confused with the 70s singing group. Who knows what I'm talking about? Anybody? 
And my doctor, yeah, because I talked to my doctor last week, and I said to her, yeah, I hear you on FM. And she's like, what? What does that mean? Seriously? I hear you on FM. Well, you gave me the 411 and I hear you on FM, right? For many of us, we know that that's, you gave me the information and I hear you loud and clear. She didn't get it until I said, I hear you on XM. I was strange. She said, well, I'm not very old, but I get what you're saying. I'm thinking to myself, she's 10 years younger than I am. Who remembers that expression? Does anybody remember? I hear you on FM. Yeah. Julie? No, you don't remember it? May go on. No, really? I don't know where that was. I think over the years, expressions and things we use come and go. Who remembers gag me with a spoon? It was these Valley Girls out of California. And specifically, it was run by a, a, a girl, uh, Frank Zappa's daughter. Frank Zappa's a musician. And Frank Zappa's daughter, Moon Unit, I know, her name was Moon Unit, and her brother's name was Dweezel. But she had this thing, and she would say, oh, gag me with a spoon. And I was in high school at the time. Well, it tells you how old I am, but. I was in high school at the time, and we came up with this thing called the Mountain Boys. And we used to say, gag me with a bear paw, right? And we used to make fun of this thing because it was so outrageous and outlandish. I think the secret, and what I'm getting at here to good communication, is that the message that we're giving out is actually the message that's received. As fathers, we want the message that we give to our children to be received by our children with the heart and the intent in which we give it, don't we? And so taking the time and effort to be clear with our kids is important. Now, my daughter said to me the other day, sorry, Harry, but I'm going to throw it out there. She said to me, Dad, you know that teenage, Dad, she's 29 years old, Dad, it was, it was funny because she was trying to communicate to me that she's 29 years old now and she doesn't need that fathering anymore. I'm an adult now. Okay, I'm going to ask dads, by a show of hands, how many of you have stopped fathering when your kids became like 20 years old? No. Dang it. <laughs> it never ends. I am 55 years old, and I still have a father and mother, and I still respect them, and I still listen to them, and I still hear their guidance. The role of a father doesn't end when you become an adult. It simply changes. Where I used to say, don't do that anymore, Ariana. Now it's, my dear daughter, my advice to you is this. And I've stepped in my role from being the authoritarian, controlling individual, king of my house, to a role of advisor. Dad's, who's been there? It's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Where you step back and you become an advisor instead of the guy saying, don't do this. And I think it shows that transition between teenage years and adulthood, where our role shifts but it doesn't diminish. And I think that our God the Father, when we're young kids and when we first come to the kingdom, we see a lot of don't do this and don't do that and do this and so forth. And we get a lot of strong guidance. But when we get to be mature Christians, I, 
I know the Lord says, you know what, I really think you shouldn't do that. He doesn't interfere with our free will, but he says to us, I don't think that's a good move for you. And let me tell you a little secret. When God says, I don't think it's a good idea, it's not a good idea. <laughs> because he's really sure. Who's ever been on their knees and, and asked God for advice on going somewhere and doing something? And it doesn't matter whether you're 20, whether you're 12, whether you're 50, God is going to give you direction. If you are truly seeking his face, he is going to tell you what you do with that information is up to you. And you're not free of the consequences. Does that mean you're going to lose your salvation? No. Does that mean that you're now sitting? No. What it means is you've made a mistake. How many dads here have given a piece of advice to their kids that they have not taken? <laughs> oh, just me. Okay. <laughs> How does it make your heart feel when you see them struggling as a result? Does it grieve your heart? <clears throat> yeah, it does. But they still have the right to make those choices. How does it make your heart feel when they listen and they're successful and, and, and they, they, they embrace all that God has for them and their life is just rocking and they're seeing things come together and their footsteps are ordered to the Lord and you see all these things happening. How does that make you feel, dads? I feel. For me, it makes me feel like I have been a success in guiding my child on the journey to listening to God the Father. Should I give up because I failed once? No. We just keep trying, right? Just keep picking it up. So I was reading this this week and it said, it is sad that not everyone can lay claim to having God as their father. He has a few simple requirements. First, John 1.12. First, you must receive Christ. For God the Father to be your Father, you need to receive Christ. John 1.13, you must be born of God. Romans 8 and 14, you must be led by the Spirit. This is the hard one. A lot of people can lay claim to receiving Christ. A lot of people can lay claim to being born of God. But seriously, you must be led by the Spirit. Why is that such a hard one? Who can tell me? Because you're laying down your own will. That's exactly right. You have to be obedient. And in order to do that, you've got to put your will to bed and listen to the Father. <clears throat> Young folks. How hard is it to put your own will to bed and listen to your father? It's hard sometimes. If you think you're right, and especially if you're over like 18 years old. I laugh. You, 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 know, you know what I'm talking about. you got to be led by the Spirit. Now, if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven good, good, give good things to those who ask him? Matthew 7, 11. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven good gifts, give good gift things to those who ask him? That's powerful. Is God good? Yes. Is God good all the time? Yes. Does it feel to us like he's good all the time? No. No. But he is. 
And so when we come across that and we feel that we're not in good, who moved? We did. Okay, so it's Father's Day. I should probably start my sermon soon. Ha. Since God is our Father instead of the evil one, we have an example of fatherhood to follow. This morning, do you believe that if a father learns from the example of God, that the father will be successful? Yeah. So fathers, I encourage you to look at the word of God, to learn from the example he has given you. Because your role will never end as long as you have kids. As a dad of three girls, my role as father is simple. I am to live as an example to my children so that they may see what God the Father is like through my example. I may not always be successful, but I will always try to show them God. I am far from perfect, but as a father I strive to reflect God to my children. In my failures, I teach them grace and humility. In my accomplishments, I teach them to strive for the mark. It's what I'm striving for. And here's a heads up for every parent. The kids are watching. The young adults are watching. The young, newly saved converts in the body of Christ are watching. And they're learning. By example. I have talked to some people about their fathers and have heard comments that I can't even repeat in polite company. I've seen fathers abandon their children. I've seen some that are abusive and so on. In short, not everyone's experience with their father has been a good one. That grieves my heart. Some people's image of a father reflects so poorly that people have said, if God is a father, I want nothing to do with him. When I was down at a healing conference with Randy Clark down in uh, California, on the way back, I think I've told you some of this story before, two o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting in a hot tub. This young lady and her boyfriend come into the hot tub and she says, hi guys, how you doing? Good, we had a little conversation. What are you doing today? And the guy was with said, oh, we went to a healing conference. And she goes, oh, Christians. And so I probed that. Took out my card, punched in the clock. What happened? My father was a pastor in the Assemblies of God. For those of you who don't know, that's payoff in the States. And she said, and he abused me terribly. It took a couple hours to point her to the ideal of God and get her to understand that not every man of God, not every father is like that. I want you to think for just a minute how much that grieves God that this young lady had that opinion of the Lord because of the way she was treated. I was so excited that she decided to give church another try and that it wasn't all like that. I can't even tell you. But how do you think God is going to feel when that minister standing before him and he has to give account and God says, why did you do this? If thoughts of your father bring you frustration, anger, and sadness, you can overcome this. You can have the joy of the Lord. God offers his fatherhood to those who accept him as their divine father. He freely offers this gift to all who receive his son Jesus and are willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. 
If your fatherhood example has been less than ideal, you have God the Father. If your fatherhood example has been ideal, has been perfect, has been loving and caring, consider yourself blessed. And you have God as your father. So it says, don't discourage your kids. Fathers, don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. My daughter's always on me. She gets frustrated because we're driving down the road and I'll reach over and thump her on the arm. Oh, me, yes. <laughs> Not hard. It's like a love cat. But I do it because I know it annoys my daughter. I get a reaction every single time. She's like, Dad, will you stop that? That's my sinful nature poking through a little bit. I love to see that reaction. I love to see that. I love to see that because I know that she will know in years to come that all those times we've gone fishing and hunting and all those times I've teased her, they're going to be good memories, not bad ones. I remember one of the ladies in the church hearing about that. She goes, that would drive me absolutely bananas if you did that. <laughs> and to be honest, I've stopped it in later years, but it used to drive her nuts. Guys, when you bug your kids and they have this huge reaction, does it motivate you to do it more? Yeah? What about you? Okay. Is it? I don't know that I... I can't put my finger on something like that that I do all the time. You are a good man. He knows how to play by that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> okay, well, we can shift gears to that one. Okay. Pushing buttons on the wife. How about that one? That's a very accurate. <laughs> we do it because it's fun, don't we? And yet, in all honesty, God says, Hey, don't discourage your kids. Husbands, love your wives as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for her. Maybe it's a little of the flesh creeping in. Maybe it's just a little bit of fun. I don't know. I'm not going to condemn it. I just think that it's a blast just to tease my kid. Who's ever tickled their kids? Oh, I got to get you with something. Man. <laughs> Tickling their kids. I love to tickle my kids when they were little girls. They'd run around and I'd chase them and who's had the, the claw? <laughs> the tickle monster. Who has an example of something that their father did with them that they will remember as a good memory like that? Anybody? Go ahead. Can we share? <laughs> oh. What was that? I said, did you want me to share? Yes, please. Oh. I just remember when I was probably about know, five or six or so. Mm -hmm. uh, it was winter time. And Dad said, Oh, if you guys can throw a snowball into the bucket that he put over here, I'll give you 10 cents for every snowball you put in the bucket. Mm -hmm. so I was missing it because I couldn't, you know, so he let me stand really close to the bucket. And yeah, it was good. It was fun. That's a great memory, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and each one of those incidences and things like that, they build that rapport, right? Here's this bucket, and you're throwing the snowball in, and you're getting a reward for it. How many of us have examples like that, like that with God? Where God has said, hey, come and do this, and I will give you a reward. Anybody ever had that? I have. Ray, start a church, and I'll give you a paycheck. Oh, hey, thanks. <laughs> No, I, I just, I think our God, at least in my experience, is a loving and caring God. And no matter what we do, He always tries to put us on the right track. 
Has anyone ever heard the expression, I'm coming up there in two minutes and that room better be cleaned up. And what if dad comes up? Does dad come up storming and thrashing and whatnot? Or is it just a motivational tactic to get these kids to do something? Depends on how naughty the kid is. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so, we're told to provoke each other onto good works. But we're also told, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. I'm going to ask an honest question here this morning. How many fathers, I know there's at least one, two, three, four of us here, want your children to ever be discouraged? No. That's not what dads do. We love our kids. With this scripture in mind, I thought, I don't want to discourage my kids. I want to encourage my kids. Isn't that what every father wants for their kids? Unfortunately, no. Yet as good fathers, we want to teach our kids to have a hope when they feel discouraged. We want them to be happy. We want them to be confident. We want them to be full of the joy of life. So if I'm told not to discourage, then I can actually look at this from the positive sense of Scripture and not just avoid discouragement, but like the good father, I will be there to encourage. I will be there to lift up and edify my kids. I will look at what they're doing for the Lord and I will say, well done, my son. Well done, my daughter. I will be there to lift them up every opportunity I have. I have. Oh, you've got a job. Good for you. Your first car. Praise the Lord. You were diligent and you strive for this and you achieved your goal. Well done. I will instill in them through my faith in God the Father confidence and the courage to do anything. I remember my dad used to say to me, whatever you put your mind to, son, you can accomplish. Anybody else's dad or mom ever said that to them? I will teach my kids Philippians 4.13, which tells them that they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. Seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Seems like common sense. Problem is, common sense isn't common anymore. Let me add a little insight to take this beyond a lesson in fatherhood. Corinthians 2, verses 9 to 13. That's Corinthians 2, 9 to 13. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit teaches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but by taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. What do you think the Apostle Paul means when he says that we're to give hope instead of discouragement? quite simple that Paul is telling us that we should teach our kids to have hope. But hope in what? No. Yep. Do I place my hope in money? No. Do I place my hope in fame? No. Do I place my hope in my marriage? Mm -hmm. Do I place my hope in my intellect? Mm -hmm. To me it's clear what he's saying. He is telling us that we do not need to discourage our kids, but rather instill in them a real solid and undeniable hope in God. And if your kid is 25 years old, if your kid is 30 years old, if your kid is 50 years old, and they haven't got that hope, B 
Be the father that needs to instill that in their kid. Fatherhood and motherhood doesn't end. Fathers, we need to exemplify God in our actions. We need to show our children hope in God. And we need to show this through our own hope in God. Kids start learning even before the lessons are taught by observation. So if mom and dad are going through a tough time, the kids are going to pay attention. They're going to be watching how you deal with it. Do they see how you turn to God or do they see you defeated and downtrodden? Do they see you full of joy because you tell them that no matter what the circumstance, there's always hope in God? Or do they see you at each other's throats? Do we hide what is happening from our kids? Or do we teach them that life does have challenges, but they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them? Do we allow ourselves to become discouraged or do we determine that even if we are feeling discouraged, that we will trust God? I'm a firm believer in building up a child's confidence to accomplish whatever they desire in life. But let me ask you yet another question. As a father this morning, do you stop at instilling confidence in themselves to the child? Or do we instill confidence in God in our children? See, I know as a dad, I may fail, I may make mistakes, but I know that I have a solid anchor in Jesus Christ as God the Father, as an example to my children. Man, if we're trying to be God-like in our actions and in our deeds, that's great. But the truth is we may fail at times. But if we can connect our children to God, God never fails. There's always hope in God. And I'm going to throw this in there. It's not in my sermon, but I'm going to throw it in there. How we deal with failure as men and fathers is how our children are going to see how we deal with failure. And if we deal with it with love and grace and humility, our children are going to see that too. I'm a firm believer in building up a child's confidence to accomplish whatever they want, but I want to ask yet another question. Do you want your children to have faith in you? Or do you want your children to have faith in you and a father? See, I can think of no greater epitaph for a father than for a child to look back and say, my dad was not perfect, but he always loved God. And that is the example that I will take away. Because as human beings, we may fail. We may not be perfect. But when we know that we have a God who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, who's ready to pick us up, to encourage us, to lead us and guide us, and when we instill that trust and that belief in our children, we have been successful. Mankind may make mistakes and fail, but God won't. Consider some of the great men of the Bible. Abraham had some serious issues, and yet, well, this isn't my wife, this is my sister. <laughs> you know? But he was considered a friend of God. Was Abraham perfect? 
No. So why was he considered a friend of God? Because of Abraham's faith in God. As Christian fathers, we need not only instill confidence in our children, but instill in them the confidence of God. The confidence that God will help them, that God will hold their hands, that God will lead them and guide them, that God is omnipresent, that He's always there for them, that no matter what, God is with them. We need to prepare our kids for life, and there's no better way than teaching them to have a strong faith in God, to be a good example to them, and to teach them paths of righteousness. Not provoking our children. What does Paul mean? Simply put, don't be such a heavy disciplinarian that you break your kid's spirit and discourage them. Be the example of hope for your sons and daughters by showing God. There are many dysfunctional families in our region of the country and most important and effective things a father can do are these. Gentlemen, be a Christian father, a new man in Christ Jesus. Be a man who places his hope in God and not just his own abilities. That doesn't mean don't place hope in your abilities. That means don't rely on that alone. Be the protector, encourager, and edifier of your family. What am I saying? We as Christian fathers are taught to exemplify God. In 1 Peter 1.16 it says, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Luke 6.36, be merciful even as your father is merciful. We as Christian fathers watched our fathers. I used to imitate my dad as a kid. He was awesome and so I honored him. How many dads love it when their kids would imitate them? Did you guys ever have that experience? Kids imitating him? Yeah. Well, that's cool. I, I would practice my guitar, for example, and Ariane and Athena had these two little electric um, guitars with push buttons on them. Oh yeah, white and black. And they would come into the living room and dance around saying, praise Jesus, and practice playing on these guitars. What a blessing to my heart. When I'm sitting here this week at home, and Rhea comes up to me and she says, Jesus is Lord, hallelujah. Yeah. What else did she say this week, Julie? Praise Jesus. Praise. She says, praise Jesus a lot. She said, hallelujah, Jesus is Lord, amen. Those things encourage my heart. In the middle of the end of her tour of her high school, she was telling the other kids that in the hallway. In the hallway in the high school, she was evangelizing. I figure if we should accept everybody and everything, then we should be able to accept Christians evangelizing too, right? Why not have the truth in with a lot of other stuff? We as Christian fathers watched our fathers. I used to imitate my dad as a kid. You know, my dad is a guitar and trumpet player, and I'm a guitar and trumpet player. I wonder how that happened. Young guys, you ever do anything that your dad does? Yeah. We inherit those things. Many of us desire to teach our children and do so and enjoy the process to see our kids develop. This is important. But to me, even more than teaching my child, I need to know who I am before God and what my relationship to my Heavenly Father is like because my children are watching. Do as I say, not as I do is often heard. But that's a cop-out on our responsibilities as fathers. I can remember when I was a kid, you know, don't smoke, son. And this is not my dad, I just used to see this, right? But don't smoke, son. I remember Dr. Wilson 
our old country doctor in William Slate, telling my mother, you should not smoke, it's bad for your health, health, as he lit up his pipe in the office. <laughs> a word for that where I come from. It's a little hypocritical. Right? Do as I say, not as I do. We are being watched. We need to be good examples. My final point is this, Dad. Ephesians 6.1 Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord, because this is right. Fathers and mothers are obeyed by their children. Fathers, we are to obey God the Father as our Father. Fathers, you are the head of the home. You are to be the protector of your family, to take responsibility for the moral life of your family. This morning, I urge you to strongly consider what has been said today, to take up that responsibility and to bring hope and encouragement to your family. And I'm sure many of you already have and are. The only way I know to be 100% effective in this is to be sure that I am placing my confidence, my hope, my faith, and my happiness in God. This morning, I want to encourage you fathers. Being a father is not always easy. It's not always the simple thing to do. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we have to not be the friend and lay down some strong rules. But you know what? When our hearts are pure, when our hearts are for serving God, that message is being passed to our kids. And when our daughters grow up to be mothers or when our sons grow up to be fathers, when they have those examples, those experiences to draw on, it makes them stronger as parents. God is good all the time. This morning I want to encourage you fathers. I want to say well done for what you have done. If you feel that there's somewhere or some way that you have not been successful, then just pray. Ask God for grace. I know in the past I've made mistakes, and I've just sat down with my kids and I've said, you know what? I messed up. I took this approach and I think this was wrong. I know it's really hard on our pride. I'm speaking from experience. But sometimes rebuilding and showing that you can own where you've messed something up can rebuild faith in situations that are damaged. And I may or not be speaking to any of the men here today, but I know that there are people out there on, on the internet that I'm speaking to where this has significant impact in your lives. And I pray that if you've messed up dramatically with your family, that you just sit down and you make it right. And if you follow the example of God the Father, you can rebuild, you can restore, and you can father your family once again. For those fathers that have left their families, that have abandoned their responsibilities, I encourage you to fix that. Have the rapport with your children. Nobody expects perfection, but you should try. God has been given to us as a great example. And today I just want to encourage you that whether you have a father or not, whether your father is still alive or not, God loves you. He is the great Father, and He stands ready to lead you and to guide you and to help you order your footsteps. If you are lost, a good Father doesn't leave you lost. If you are struggling and you are hungry, a good Father does not leave you hungry. So this morning, 
I'd like to say thank you, God, for being a good example as a father. And I'd like to say to each and every person here that if you need God, that he is the good father to reach out. And if you're a father here this morning, you've already been successful because you're here this morning. You're already following after God. You're already showing fatherhood. I'd like to pray for the fathers this morning, so if you could bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I just pray mightily this morning that you reach down and you'll touch our fathers, that you will lift them up, that you will encourage them. God, that you will let them know that you love them, that you will strengthen them, Fatherhood is not the easiest of roles, but God, I just pray right now that we can do all things through your Son that strengthens us. I pray, God, that we will be strengthened in this. I pray, Lord, that where there has been trouble or struggle in the past, God, that you have said in Romans 8 and 28 that you will work all these things together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purposes. I pray, Lord, that where there has been breaches, they will be healed and repaired in the name of Jesus. Where there has been abandonment, I pray, God, that you will once again turn the, the hearts of the sons and the daughters back to their fathers. I pray, Lord, that the fathers will have their hearts turned towards their sons and their daughters. I pray, Jesus, that on this special day that we honor dads, God, that your love will shine forth that your love will shine forth and be so, so very clear. And I pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. And I thank you for it. And there all people said? Amen. Amen. Okay, so... Amen. I've left out a little uh, bucket at the back there. If anybody wants to contribute or put in tithe or offerings or anything else, that's a great place to do that. And I'll pick it up from there at the end of the service. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to pray. But I'm going to ask before we go, does anyone need prayer for anything right now? Is there anyone who specifically needs prayer? Okay. Is there anyone that you know of that you want us to pray for? Samantha, uh, is there any disclosed issue or? Yeah, given, I think, six weeks to live or something like that. She's, 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 had, she's been battling with the cancer for quite a while. I guess it was her pancreas, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but I, you know, she's, she's a Christian. Mm -hmm. she's, she's a peace. So awesome. It's all good. Um, she's my age. Um, wow. But, uh, yeah, so I mean, a God could heal her or, you know, or, or not, but just, if, if he will, that'd be great. Yes. Well, we're going to pray for her right now. And the thing is, is that um, sometimes God heals, takes us across the veil. Sometimes he heals us here. Yeah. So let's pray for her right now. Lord, we bring Samantha before you, God. We first of all pray peace in her heart. Lord, she knows that she's going to be with you. She knows where she's going. Her, her eternity is secured. And we praise you, Jesus, and thank you for that. But Lord, we also know that these times when we're so close uh, to our mortality are very difficult for both us and our families. And so I just pray, Lord, a, a blessing over her family, over her heart. I pray, Jesus, that you will strengthen her. I pray, God, that you will heal her. Lord, I, I call upon your will to heal her. And I just ask God that, that, you will, that you will just touch her family, Lord, that you will bring them peace in this situation, that they know that you're in control. And Jesus, I just ask that you wrap her up in the cords of your love, God, that she feels your presence suffusing her, and that, God, you just are right there with her right now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Is there anybody else before we pray? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Heavenly Father, God, our brother Ralph, we just ask right now, Jesus, that you will touch his lungs. God, that you will bless him, that you will heal this up, God, that you will...
cause his life to be eased, God, through the easing of this suffering. In fact, God, just heal it right now in Jesus' name. We pray, God. We just ask, Lord, that your divine providence will decide and choose right now, God, to heal Ralph. Lord, we know that it's not within us, but we know that you have the ability to heal. You are the great physician. You have said by your stripes we are healed. And so, Lord, we bring Ralph to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Does anyone else want to pray for Ralph? Thank you. Well, you Ralph. Good. All right. If you're happy with that, then we're good. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the people that are here this morning. God, I thank you for those people that have come into the service, that have attended, that have encouraged. And, and God, I just thank you that they are here being faithful in fellowship. I just ask right now, Jesus, that you'll bless them. As we go from this place, God, I pray that you will keep them in safeguard. I pray, Lord, that you will just uh, touch their families, that as they go on the highways and the byways, that your host will cover over them and keep them safe as they travel. And I pray, Jesus, a special blessing this week in their hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Self-serving announcement, don't forget to pray for your pastor this week. P.S. That's me. Okay? Please pray for me this week. I covet your prayers. They're very important, and I really feel the difference when you're hedging me up in your prayer. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have an absolutely amazing Father's Day. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>